If you've heard anything about the Donner Party, you've probably heard about cannibalism. But the Donner Party story is so much more than just people eating other people in the mountains. It's a story of resilience and resignation, people being greedy, people sacrificing. It's a story of ordinary people being put in an incredibly unordinary situation and seeing how they come out of it. So in the 1840s, the West Coast of America was beginning to get a lot of attention uh, from people who saw potential. Now, a new book had been written by a lawyer named Lansford Hastings, An Immigrant's Guide to Oregon and California. Hastings' idea was to flood the California area with settlers from the United States, which would eventually tip the population balance in favor of California becoming its own republic. It worked in Texas. To do this, Hastings wrote about how great the climate in California was, how easy it was to raise crops and irrigate them. Basically, he made it to be the new promised land. Supposedly, he also publicized a shortcut that would take hundreds of miles off the normal trail. This shortcut would come to be known as the Hastings Cutoff. Hastings' book figures prominently in the popular myth of the Donner Party, and there's a lot of controversy around Hastings and the root in his book. So I read it. In the second to last chapter, after describing the general route of the Oregon and California trails, Hastings writes, the most direct route for the California immigrants would be to leave the Oregon route about 200 miles east from Fort Hall, thence bearing west-southwest to the Salt Lake and thence continuing down to the Bay of San Francisco by the route just described. That's it. That's his entire mention of the cutoff. Hastings had not traveled this route when he wrote this, and when you read it, it comes off like he's just making a note about a possible path, not describing an actual route. The Donner Party itself is named after two brothers, George and Jacob Donner. They are fairly well-to-do farmers from the Springfield, Illinois area. They had moved every few years or so, and recently they had heard good things about California. So they decided to pull up stakes and give it a shot. George and his third wife, Tamsin, had three young children, Francis, Georgia, and Eliza. And George also had two daughters from a previous marriage, Elitha and Leanna. Jacob and his wife, Elizabeth, had five children from three to nine years old and Elizabeth's two boys from a previous marriage, Solomon and William Hook. In total, the Donners had six wagons and two Teamsters to assist with the wagons, Noah James and Samuel Shoemaker. Along with the Donners were the Reed family, headed by James and Margaret Reed. Remember James, we're gonna be seeing a lot of him. He'd been a successful businessman in Springfield, but had a bit of bad luck and was ready to try out California. With James and Margaret were their four children, Virginia, Patty, James Jr., and Thomas two half-sibling servants, Bayless and Eliza Williams, three Teamsters for driving the wagons, and last but not least, Margaret's 70-year-old mother, Sarah. She was sickly and confined to her bed inside the Reed's family wagon, but refused to be separated from her only daughter. Speaking of the Reed's wagon, this is not your normal prairie wagon. James had built a two-story wagon for his family to travel to California in. It has a stove, seats, and beds for the kids. You get into it from the side instead of the front and back like ordinary wagons. It also takes double the amount of oxen to pull this bad boy. Now in his book, Hastings recommends getting to Independence, Missouri by April 15th and getting on the road before May 1st. This way your animals have plenty of grass to eat on the trail and you're going to get into your destination before snows come. By early April, the different families and people that are making up the Donner Party are beginning to coalesce around Independence. An Iowa farming family, the Breens, leaves their small town in early April and meets up with a large company leaving Independence. Patrick and Margaret Breen are Irish immigrants and devout Catholics, which doesn't sit well with the rising nativist tendencies in the U.S. at the time. They're moving their seven children, along with family friend Patrick Dolan, to California, where they figure Catholicism is more accepted. The Donners and Reeds leave Springfield on April 14th with nine wagons in total. They arrive at Independence on May 10th and leave town a couple of days later. They're a little behind Hastings' schedule, but they're not alone. There are hundreds of other immigrants sharing the trail with them. There's no real modern experience that compares to traveling on the Oregon Trail. There's not a lot of structure to it. Groups called companies will form, leaders get elected, then these companies will shift memberships or dissolve as members race ahead or fall behind. It's not like someone's calling attendance every morning. These immigrants are leaving civilization as they know it behind. There's no laws, there's no police, there's no safety net. It's big boy and big girl rules. After a few days, the party cross into Kansas and make their way to the Big Blue River. Here they catch up with a large company of immigrants, including the Breens, waiting for the river waters to subside enough for a crossing. Another family, the Murphys from West Tennessee, catch up with the company here. Headed by widow Lavina Murphy, her family includes two sons-in-law and three grandchildren. 
they've spent the last two months gathering the family together and making their way along the trail. While at the Big Blue River on May 29th, Sarah Keyes dies. It had been expected, but it still hit the Reed family hard all the same. Nearly all the immigrants along the river attended her funeral, and Donner Party member John Denton carved her headstone. By the end of the month, the party had ferried across and resumed their journey. The party spends June traveling across Nebraska, averaging about 15 to 20 miles a day. A wagon belonging to a man named Louis Kiesberg tips over, dumping his pregnant wife and daughter out of the wagon. However, they're okay, and after some repairs, they continue on the journey. You're gonna wanna remember Kiesberg. He's gonna come into play later on. Another name mentioned is William Eddy, who helps the other immigrants keep their wagons repaired. He's moving to California with his wife and two kids. As the wagon train rolls on, the dry climate actually makes the wooden wheels shrink and separate from the metal tires, and Eddie's knowledge of how to fix wagons and carriages will come in handy. The party meets and follows the Platte River westward. The immigrants' journals and diaries from this time are filled with descriptions of hunting buffalo and antelope, the wildflowers they see, using buffalo crap to fuel their fires, stuff like that. It's people getting exposed to a foreign country they've only heard about. In the middle of the month, Tamsin Donner famously writes to a friend, Indeed, if I do not experience something far worse than I have yet done, I shall say the trouble is all in getting started. On the 23rd, the party passes Chimney Rock, and four days later they reach Fort Laramie. Here the party meets a legit mountain man, James Kleiman, heading east. Kleiman had served with Reed and Abraham Lincoln in the Black Hawk War, and had traveled the area Hastings described in his cutoff. Reed brought up the fact that the Hastings cutoff would be a more direct route, and Kleiman said, yeah, it is, but you also have to go through a desert and over the Sierras. The regular route is hard enough. The cutoff might be impossible for wagons. Reed really seems to want to take the most direct route, which fits with his personality. Reed is direct, assertive, which can come across as overbearing and just a jerk to the other immigrants. By early July, the massive party that's traveled together, hundreds of immigrants, it's starting to break up. Families need to spread out some so their animals have enough grass to graze. Some of the single fellas trade wagons for pack mules, which allows them to move quicker along the trail. Wherever they are, all of the immigrants stop to celebrate July 4th, and then they nurse their hangovers on July 5th. The immigrants continue their journey up the Platte, hunting buffalo every day and making decent time. They reach Independence Rock by the 11th. The immigrants aren't really impressed by the rock formation's appearance. Generally speaking, travelers tried to reach Independence Rock by July 4th, so this puts the Donner Party about a week behind schedule not too bad. The party soon separates between the people leaving for Oregon and the people leaving for California, leaving the Donners, the Reeds, and a few other families totaling about 18 wagons and around 70 people. California bound, the party follows the Sweetwater River through its rugged valley and on the 18th enters South Pass. Up ahead at Fort Bridger, Lansford Hastings himself greets incoming immigrants and promises to lead them on his new cutoff around the south side of Salt Lake. Edwin Bryant, a friend of the Donners and Reeds, and who had now transferred his supplies on the pack mules, writes letters to his friends further back on the trail, advising them not to take the new cutoff, but to stick to the old road via Fort Hall. At this point, things start to turn for the immigrants. Western Wyoming is a far cry from Nebraska. Some of the oxen start dying from bad water, and without more experienced travelers helping them out, the Donner party starts failing to pick the best spots along the way to set up camp. Around this time, the Donners pick up a 25-year-old man named Luke Halloran, who's slowly dying from tuberculosis. The Donners let him ride in one of their wagons. Now the immigrants reach the Green River and follow it to Bridger's Fort. This fort is run by Jim Bridger, the Jim Bridger, legendary mountain man. A new cutoff is bypassed Bridger's Fort, which is bad for business. But Hastings Cutoff runs right past Bridger's Fort, so he has a vested interest in promoting it. Now allegedly, Bridger and his business partner might have prevented Brian's letters from reaching their intended audience. The party gets a few new faces. William and Amanda McCutcheon and their infant daughter Harriet join the party, as does a 16-year-old guide named John Baptiste Trudeau. After resting for a few days and replacing animals, the party leaves Fort Bridger on July 31st. James Reed is optimistic about taking the cutoff. He thinks the party is about 250 miles from California instead of the 650 or 700 they would be if they took the Fort Hall route. Aside from a 40 mile long stretch of desert, which Hastings and his party should find the best way through for him, the road is supposed to be nice and level with plenty of grass and water. Reed figures they'll be in the Sacramento area by the end of September at the latest. As August begins, the party makes good time along the Bear River headed towards Salt Lake. 
On the 6th, they find a note left on the bush from Hastings. He's led a wagon train through Weber Canyon, but it has been a rough road. If they send three men up ahead, Hastings will show the Donner Party a better route. Reed, Charles Stanton, and William Pike ride forward about 20 miles to meet Hastings. While Stanton's and Pike's horses recover, Reed rides with Hastings to a nearby mountaintop, and Hastings points out a course Reed's party should take. Reed marks the route shown to him and meets back at the camp on the evening of the 10th. He tells the immigrants about the impossibility of the Weber Canyon Road and how they're going to have to make a road through the nearby Wasatch Mountains. At the same time Reed arrives in camp, the Graves family finally catches up to the party. Headed by Franklin and Elizabeth Graves, the Graves family has 10 members, plus their son-in-law Jay Fostick and their teamster, 25-year-old John Snyder. They had come from Marshall County, Illinois, and had joined the last wagon train leaving Independence, Missouri. With their arrival, all of our main players in the Donner Party saga are finally together. The next day, the immigrants begin cutting a path out of the trees and rocks that will allow the wagons to get through. Progress slows to a crawl. The party's lucky to make two miles a day. While they're clearing the road from the east, Stanton and Pike return from the west and help steer the direction the road should take through easier ground. By August 24th, the party finally crosses the Wasatch. It's taken two and a half weeks of tough labor that has been hard on the animals as well. The next day, Luke Halloran, the man the Donners had let ride in their wagon, dies. He was buried in the salty ground by the roadside and given a Masonic funeral. As the party rolls south of Salt Lake, they prepare themselves for the next big obstacle, the Great Salt Desert. Now Hastings had told them they'd be across it in two days. They start the drive at the end of the month. At this point, when you read the party's diaries and letters, you start seeing the phrase, giving out. To give out didn't mean you'd need a nap and a drink and you'd be good to go. Giving out means the end. Like when the oxen gave out, they were left to die. At this point, the immigrants start talking about cattle giving out. Here in a few months, they're gonna talk about people giving out. So after about four days in the desert, the situation was getting desperate. Many of the immigrants unhitch their oxen and drive them towards water at the end of the desert, figuring they'd come back for their wagons later. Reed's cattle, maddened by thirst, ran off into the dark desert night. They're never seen again. Reed's family struggles through the last miles of desert and collapse. They huddle together in the freezing desert and use their dogs to keep warm. What they were told was a 40 mile stretch of desert is actually closer to 75. The immigrants spend the next week retrieving wagons, searching for cattle and resting their animals. Reed was unable to locate most of his cattle and had to borrow enough to pull his family wagon. Since he only has one wagon left, he doesn't need the teamsters he hired. So they begin hiring themselves out to the other families. Other people are also forced to leave wagons behind. As the party takes stock of their situation, they realize two things. One, they don't have enough food to get to California. And two, the hilltops around them are starting to get dusted with snow. Two men, Charles Stanton and William McCutcheon, volunteer to ride towards Sutter's Fort in present day Sacramento to ask for supplies. By this point, the pressures of the journey are starting to wear on the immigrants. Patience is wearing thin and tempers are starting to flare. Families are beginning to separate from other families. You're not getting this, we're all in this together vibe. By the middle of the month, the party reaches the Ruby Mountains. Now there is a path through the north side of the mountain range that the wagons could make fairly easily. But Lansford Hastings doesn't know about this route. The Donner Party definitely doesn't know about this route. So they had to detour around the southern side of the mountains. This eats more of the party's time, although the route is a little easier going than what they have been used to. It takes about 10 days for the party to go south around the mountains, come back north, and finally finish the Hastings cutoff. It's taken the immigrants over two months to navigate the cutoff, or about a month slower than the people who use the regular road. Even the group ahead of the Donners that Hastings had led through the canyon are about two weeks ahead of them. Everyone knows they're against the clock now. For the next week plus, the party moves along the Humboldt River, losing animals almost every night to Indian attacks and trying to make the best time they can. On October 5th, as the wagons are being lugged up Iron Point, an argument breaks out between John Snyder, teamster for the Graves family, and James Reed. Everyone has their own version of what happened, but we know an argument broke out after some wagons got tangled up. Snyder hit Reed and possibly Mrs. Reed with his whip handle, and Reed stabs Snyder, who dies after about 20 minutes. The Donners are two days ahead of everyone else and they can't be reached. Some people feel Reed's actions are justified. Others, notably Louis Kiesberg, thinks Reed should be hanged right there. Finally, an agreement is reached. 
Reed agrees to leave the party as long as other immigrants agree to take care of his family. In the ensuing years, other Donner Party survivors will tell their version of the Iron Point incident, but James Reed is never able to talk about it. In his version, he went ahead to make sure supplies were going to come to the party. Reed catches up with the Donners, and one of his old Teamsters, Walter Heron, agrees to go to California with him. A few days after the homicide, the Reed family leaves their last wagon behind. They're entirely on foot now, as are some of the more impoverished families. Kiesberg kicks Hardcoop, a 60-year-old Belgian, out of his wagon. Hardcoop isn't able to get a seat on any of the other wagons and is forced to hobble behind the party on swollen feet. He's last seen sitting under a scrub brush, unable to walk any further. The party continues on the Humboldt, losing more cattle almost nightly. On October 15th, Wolfinger loses all of his oxen except one to an Indian attack. He's forced to cash his wagon, but the other families don't wait for him. Two men, Augustus Spitzer and Joseph Reinhardt, agree to help Wolfinger bury his belongings. Wolfinger is rumored to be wealthy. A few days later, Reinhardt and Spitzer rejoin the party, saying that Indians attacked and killed Wolfinger. Eddie and his family also leave their wagon behind. They have no more oxen to pull it. He and his wife carry their children on foot along the river. About this time, Charles Stanton and William McCutcheon arrive at Sutter's Fort. Just like the rumors say, Captain Sutter is generous and loans Stanton seven mules loaded with flour and dried meat for the party. The trip to the fort has been a tough one and McCutcheon has fallen ill. He can't make the return trip just yet. Captain Sutter sends two of his Vesfriqueros, Luis and Salvador, to help Stanton with the mules. Now the Humboldt River doesn't empty into a lake or an ocean. It just disappears into the desert at a place called the Humboldt Sink. From here you have to cross 40 miles of desert to get to the Truckee River, which flows out of the Sierra Nevada mountains. The immigrants now have to cross this desert with almost no food or water. It takes them three days and they leave even more dead oxen on the trail behind them. When they finally reach the Truckee River, all semblance of unity among the party has vanished. It's everyone for themselves now. In the mountains, Reed and Heron have planned on being able to live off of wild game, but there hasn't been anything to hunt. They're beginning to starve and are living off of wild vegetables near the trail. Fortunately, in the Bear River Valley, they meet Stanton and the mules on their way back to the party. Reed realizes the supplies Stanton is bringing back won't be enough for everyone, so he continues on to Sutter's Fort. Walter Heron isn't well enough to travel, so he recuperates with settlers in the area. His part of the story is done. Meanwhile, the party has stopped at Truckee Meadows, resting for the final push over the Sierra Nevadas. On October 24th, two brothers-in-law, William Foster and William Pike, are cleaning their pistols in camp. Foster's pistol accidentally discharges, shooting Pike in the back. He dies after about an hour. After Pike's burial, some families begin slowly moving up the Truckee River. They can see the snow on the tops of the mountains, and they know that time is running out. Others want to rest the remaining animals for the final push. Around October 27th, the party gets a huge boost. Stanton is back. Along with the supplies, he tells the Reed family that James is alive, albeit a little rough for wear. On the 28th, Reed reaches Fort Sutter and Captain Sutter again offers whatever supplies Reed needs to help the immigrants. Towards the end of the month, the front axle in George Donner's wagon breaks. Eliza and Georgia are almost crushed by boxes in the wagon, but everybody's okay. While shaping a tree to replace the axle, George cuts the back of his right hand. The Donners are passed by the other families on their way to the mountain pass. It's looking like a storm is coming. On the last day of the month, most of the party, headed by the Breen family, tries to go over the mountain pass, but the snowfall is up to the wagon axles and they can't make out the road. They are forced to turn back to a lake on the east side of the summit. It will be months before anybody is able to cross the pass. It's been an exhausting, grueling effort for months, and the Donner Party is now stuck only miles from their final destination. Now the nightmare really begins.